Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's file, The Serviceman's Fraud. The war is over and the fighting men are coming home. But for the FBI, the war, the fight against fascism is not over. In a sense, it still goes on. Because the fight against democracy still goes on. Not only overseas, but right here in this country. In a Midwestern state, for example, where a thin, white-haired man named Martin Bessemer was trying to form an organization called the United Brotherhood of America. Bessemer made his speeches in a large hall, and in his audiences were many veterans of our war against fascism. Directly behind this hall, he had his offices, a large outer reception room and a small inner office used only by Bessemer, by his red-haired secretary and by his business manager, a hard, quiet-faced man called Frank Kingston. Leila, hmm? you finished typing that letter? Right over there. Oh, okay. When's Bessemer going to sign it? As soon as he finishes rousing the rabble. <laughs> oh. oh, you know, baby, a million copies of this ought to open a few thousand vets with plenty of separation pay. They could all hear him talk. You know something funny, Frank? Hmm? I listened to him the other day. And you almost believed him. Almost? If I'd had my purse, I would have handed over the membership fee and joined up. <laughs> well, the more suckers who feel that way, the more money in the bank for us. For us? Yeah. We're in it together, baby. Frank. Huh? When are you going to get him to sign that check? I told you that when... When the he... time comes. Yeah. And I told you, I'm not going to sit around here waiting for dollar bills to start... Hello, Mr. Bessemer. Hello, Frank. Hello, Lila, my dear. Hello, Mr. Bessemer. Uh, you've been working hard today, haven't you? Pretty hard. Well, I'll take your dinner tonight and make sure you're getting enough to eat. Oh, uh, here's the letter we drew up, Mr. Bessemer. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, the United Brotherhood of America has a particular appeal for our veterans. I realize their plight and promise to give every honorably discharged man who joins the Brotherhood a battle bonus amounting to... I've never promised anything of the kind, Frank. Well, there are a couple of million vets waiting for somebody to lead them someplace, Mr. Bessemer. You know, vets with dough. <laughs> you want to get them to join, don't you? Well, naturally. Then sign here. Oh, now, look. Uh... You hired me to boost your membership. Sign here. Kingston, nobody tells me what to do. Nobody. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Bessemer. I didn't mean to sound as though I were giving orders. I was just thinking that if we can pull in the vets, the organization ought to get big enough to swing your election at the state legislature. Or maybe even Congress. Hmm. Well, in that case, uh, let me have your pen, Frank. Okay. Here. Uh, thanks. Uh, there we are. I'll pick you up about six, uh, Lila. Okay. Goodbye, my dear. Bye. Goodbye, Frank. Yeah, goodbye now. He'll pick me up at six. So what? So we'll have dinner and he'll slobber over me again. All right. All right, nothing. What kind of a guy are you to let someone else take your You won't be bothered much longer. No? No. Our friend just signed his last will and testament. This letter? Yeah. It's going to mean a killing for us and a finish for him. How? Well, it's going to hook a lot of poor fish, baby. But it's also going to make somebody start an investigation. For instance? I don't know. But when they come around, we're going to be gone. And Mr. Martin Bessemer is going to be left holding the bag. It's easier to get a mailing list of veterans. And it's easy to stir up some of those veterans. The end of the war doesn't mean peace for the country. It means a period of transition, reconversion, change. Many fighting men who have come home want that period to be swift and sure and right. So when they read a letter like Martin Bessemer's, many veterans get excited. Some want to join his organization. And some, some react the way a boy like Eddie Butler did. Eddie is calling on his girl. Sorry I kept you waiting, Eddie. Like my new dress? Huh? I asked you if you liked my new dress. Oh, yeah. Yeah, new, isn't it? Eddie, when we get married, my clothes won't... That bird ought to have his head handed to him. What are you talking about? I'm sorry, honey. A letter came this afternoon. I didn't get a chance to read it. You read it now. Put it away. But look at it. I don't want to. From a gent named Martin Bessemer. He's the head of an outfit called... The United Brotherhood of American Wars. I know. How do you know? My brother Bobby got one this morning. What did he say? Oh, I don't know. He said he wants to join. Join this? Yes. Well, he can read, can't he? Listen to this. The United Brotherhood is an organization restricted to members of the Caucasian race. That's a fancy way of saying Aryans. All right, Eddie. And this juicy little warning that we veterans have to rise up and throw the foreigners... All right, Eddie. But, Nora, don't you see Give me that letter. Nora! I'm sorry. I don't get it, honey. I don't get you. Me? Eddie, sit down. No, here by me. Okay. Darling... I know it was pretty bad overseas, and you went through a lot. But you're home now, darling, and the war is over. The fighting's over, you mean. What? As long as there are weasels like this Martin Bessemer around, it's not over. Look, honey, I I get mad, but don't try to chalk it up to combat fatigue or anything like that. I get mad because I see that maybe there's a chance all that fighting was for nothing. Eddie, that's silly. Silly, yeah, and your kid brother joins a peachy little group restricted to members of the Caucasian race. He's a kid, and it's a small, unimportant organization. There are a couple of million kids and plenty of these small, unimportant organizations for them to join. Eddie. No, I am mad. I don't like it, Nora. I don't like that it's going on, and we let it go on. What can we do? I know what I'm going to do. What? I'm going to join Mr. Bessemer's little restricted bunch. What? He'll get me into one of his meetings so I can find out what he's up to. If he's up to what I think he is, Mr. Martin Bessemer better watch out. Martin Bessemer did not know that the FBI had been checking on his activities. But he'd been smart enough to stop just short of a violation for which he could be arrested. And now one of his letters come to the FBI's attention. Martin Bessemer. Yeah, According to the files, Dan, he's been spreading his poison since 1937. He was mixed up with a bun, but he went into hiding as soon as we invaded North Africa. Smart boy. Uh Uh-huh. But now he's out again. We've never been able to get anything on him. Even this new organization he's trying to get started has a bona fide setup legally. Well, maybe this letter is what we've been waiting for. I think it is. As a matter of fact, I think he's bitten off more than he can chew in this one sentence right here. Look. He promises to give every honorably discharged man a battle bonus. Yeah. 
Probably sucked in a lot of members that way. But if he can't pay off, we can put him out of business. Right. Beats me how a rat like that can keep going anyway. It's a wonder that someone doesn't get so mad at him that... Well, let's get moving. We'd better take a good look at Mr. Martin Bessemer's books. Well, it's about time you showed up. I've had my hands full, Lila. Who was she? Oh, stop being cute. I just had a big session with some vet named Eddie Butler. He's helped to knock Bessemer's block off. I know. He was here before. But we've got a bigger problem. What do you mean? I had a visitor. A gentleman named Sherman. Sherman? From the FBI. What do you want? To look at the books. You didn't let him? No. But he said he'd be back at three. Hmm. It's almost that now. I know. What are we going to do, Frank? Oh, it's going to be all right, baby. It says here. I tell you, it's going to be all right. All this means is that we clear out a little ahead of schedule. Without the money? With the money. Well, he hasn't signed that check yet. Huh. You will. Hello, Lila, my dear. Oh, hello. hello, Frank. Oh, I'm glad you're here, Mr. Bessemer. Uh, anything wrong? Well, yes, we've gotten some disturbing news. What? Well, the FBI was here to look at our books. The FBI? Why? Well, I guess it's because of that last letter you sent out. One where you promised the boys a battle bonus. You see, if they look at our books and find that you can't pay that bonus... They could send you up for fraud. Go on. Well, I've got a check here already for your signature, Mr. Bessemer. It's for the money in our account. Well, uh, what do you plan to do with it? We can take the money and run. Take it and run? Yeah. You cheap jinx! Don't be so easy with your hands, Mr. Bessemer. You've got everything ready, haven't you? You knew this was coming and you planned for it. So what? You cheap little racketeer. <laughs> Easy, Bessemer. Uneducated scum that'll do anything for money. I warned you. You are scum. You're from the slums and your parents were... <laughs> now maybe you'll keep your hands to yourself. He's dead, Frank. I don't care. What are you going to do? What are we going to do, you mean? What? We're in it together, baby. Remember? And we're Shh. good. What's the matter? Somebody's in the outer office. Huh? I heard him. We'll see who it is. Just open that door a crack. Oh, Frank. Go on. It's that boy. What boy? That veteran, Eddie Butler... The one who wanted to knock Bessemer's head. <laughs> We're both thinking the same thing, baby. Frank. It'll work. Come on. Help me lift Bessemer's body behind the desk. Oh. Why? You don't want the kid to see him when he walks in. No. <sighs> now, where's that check? It's here. What are you going to do? Get out the back door into the bank before it closes. Oh, the check's not signed. Uh, that's okay. I know his signature. Frank. Stop worrying, baby. I'll get in touch with him and let you know where I am. You won't forget. We're in it together, aren't we? Yeah. We're in it together, all right. Okay. Here. What? Take my gun. You know what to do with it, don't you? Yeah. So long, baby. Mr. Butler? Yeah? Come in, won't you? Thanks. You're waiting to see Mr. Bessemer? Yeah, I saw him come in here and then... Say, did I hear a couple of shots? Shots? Why, no. Not from here. Or what you must have heard... What's the matter? Look behind the desk. Huh? Holy... It's Bessemer. And isn't this yours? What? This gun. Here, take it. But... It's yours, isn't it? No. Oh, yes, it is. Come in. Oh, Mr. Sherman. I'm so glad you're here. This man just shot Mr. Bessemer. We 
momentarily close the Equitable Society's presentation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on the serviceman's fraud. We will return to this case in just a moment. There's something about the name of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States that seems to arouse quite a lot of interest. Again and again, people say to us, by the way, why is the Equitable Society called a society? Well, that question is easily answered. The Equitable Life Assurance Society is called a society because it is a society, in every sense of the word. It is an association of men and women who share the conviction that contentment and security depend on practicing the basic American virtues of thrift and self-reliance and cooperation. We who are members of the great Equitable Society family know that it isn't enough to work for ourselves alone. We know that we do better when we lend each other a helping hand. And that is why we have joined forces in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. We have combined our dollars into a common protective fund, which gives each of us far more security than he could attain by his own unaided efforts. The fact that three and a quarter million Americans think this way and have become Equitable Society members gives our organization tremendous stability and safety. At the same time, the fact that this is a society means that we individual members receive personal consideration and warm, friendly attention in all our dealings with the management. Finally, we have the satisfaction of knowing that our premium dollars are constantly invested in ways that benefit the entire nation. For, by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now, back to the file on the serviceman's fraud. <laughs> A murder is committed. A murder that's buried in the back pages because the victim is seemingly unimportant. The killer seems to be unimportant, too. Seems to be a boy named Eddie Butler. A boy with a motive. With a gun marked with his fingerprints. A boy who is actually seen by an eyewitness. The case seems open and shut. Seems to be as simple as ABC. Nevertheless, the FBI, working with local police, investigates. And investigates thoroughly. You say Butler was here earlier, miss? Oh, yes. He was raving about getting hold of Mr. Bessemer and knocking his head off. But you got rid of him. Oh, I thought I did. But then he came back about an hour ago. He just stormed in here and made a wild speech, and then he took out his gun and fired. That was a few minutes before three. Yeah. Well, I feel sorry for the kid, but that happened. What happened? Oh, you know. Those boys are trained to kill. They go overseas and do a lot of killing, and it just gets in their blood. They come home, see something they don't like, so they kill. Is that what Mr. Bessemer thought? Why? It sounds like something he might have said. I guess you liked Mr. Bessemer. No. But it was a job, Mr. Sherman. You didn't mind working for a man like that? Well, I... I'm sorry. It's really none of my business. If there's anything else we want, I'll let you know. murder is committed. But it was a letter which brought the FBI to this case. A letter involving a plan to defraud veterans. And so the books of the organization called the United Brotherhood of America are turned over to a special agent while the agent in charge aids the local police to follow up the murder. Follow it up by sending the gun in the case to the FBI laboratory in Washington. Follow it up by interviewing Eddie Butler in his cell. Doesn't make any sense, Mr. Sherman. The murder? None of it. You know, I, I was thinking, suppose I really had shot Bessemer. He was a fascist. In the Army, they taught us what a fascist is, and overseas, we saw him and killed some of them. Bessemer wasn't any different, Mr. Sherman, except maybe he was born here. Uh, don't try to make any sense out of that, Eddie. It won't go out of your head. You think I'm going out of my head anyway? Mr. Sherman, I didn't kill Bessemer, but I'm glad he was killed. And even if it hangs me, I'll keep saying that. So maybe I am out of my head. Eddie, uh, you're sure there wasn't anybody else in that office when you walked in? Just a girl. What about earlier? I thought I saw that guy go in, but I don't know. What guy? 
Some gent who'd been trying to get rid of me. What was his name? I don't know. What did he look like? Oh, pretty solid. A little taller than me. Kind of a thin, hard face. Dark hair. That's all I remember. And you don't know who he was? Well, he said he was Bessemer's business manager. Business and... manager? Yeah. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks very much. What'd you get out of the books, Dan? Oh, pretty much what we figured. Bessemer couldn't have paid off that battle bonus if he stood on his head. Not that he had any intention to. Of course not. Matter of fact, all the money was drawn out of the bank. When? About one minute before three. The teller remembered because he was ready to close up. Well, Bessemer was dead by then. Sure. But I don't know who the man was who cashed the check. He probably countersigned with a phony. Yeah, that's what I figured. The check's on its way to the lab. Good. I got a description of him, though. Slightly over medium height, dark hair, thin face. Say, that sounds like the same man Butler described. Really? Yeah. This is beginning to make sense, Dan. There's somebody else in this. Somebody who was possibly double-crossing Bessemer. Somebody who possibly murdered Bessemer or helped the girl murder. <clears throat> Hello? Sherman speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Where? Thanks. What was that? A report just came in on the gun. Serial number was filed off, but the lab got it anyway. Could they trace it? Well, the last place they traced it to was a pawn shop over on the south side. Now, look, we don't want to arrest you for selling the gun. We just want to know who you sold it to. I told you. I don't know his name. What did he look like? He was, oh, a little shorter than you. Dark. Kind of a... Wait. What? I just remembered. His name was Frank. That's what she called him. Frank. That's what who called him? The girl who was with him. A very pretty girl with red hair. Here's a report on the check, Dan. Was it a forgery? Sure. Same guy who countersigned it forged it. What's his name? Kingston. Frank Kingston. We have a lead on where he's hiding. Williams traced a call the girl made him last night. Well, let's get him then. Yeah, there's a catch. What? We can probably hold him on fraud, forgery, larceny, but... but how do we get him on murder? Yeah. As long as that girl sticks to her story, we're... You know, like... if there were only some way of getting one of them to double-cross the other... Say, I have an idea. What's that? The old bellboy trick. It might work. They've never seen you. So if we can get that girl over to Frank Kingston's apartment tonight... <laughs> Anybody to run this elevator? Hey! Hey, isn't there anybody... Take it easy, lady. Who are you? Bellboy, clerk, elevator boy, what do you have? Now, since this is an elevator, what did you think? Ah, uh, sorry you had to wait. We had a lot of checkouts today. Dump like this, I'm not surprised. What floor? Five. Five? Yeah, do you mind? No, I don't mind. Only I don't think there's anybody up there. What? Well, it was only two people. 503, she checked out this morning. And 514, he checked out a few minutes ago. 514 couldn't have. I just spoke to him on the phone. Yeah, I know. How do you know? Also worked the switchboard. Lady calls, and two minutes later, 514 calls to say he's checking out. I don't believe you. Well, see for yourself. It's right over here. But he checked out. No, it's open. Frank. Frank. See? What did I tell you? So he's gone. Oh, sure. Oh, that's great. That's just dandy. Little Frankie's gone for a walk with his pocket stuffed with money. That's beautiful. Something wrong? No, nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. Where's your phone? What are you going to do? Call the police. That man who checked out murdered Martin Bessemer. I saw him do it. I don't think you'll get very far, miss. Mr. Sherman. He's still downstairs waiting for you. Downstairs? Sure. This is 614, Lila. Six? But 
But this elevator, boys... Also house detective and FBI. So that's the way it is. Yeah. What do you think Frank is going to say when he hears the news? I think I know. He'll say we're in it together, baby. <laughs> Frank Kingston and his female accomplice were tried and convicted by local authorities on the charge of first-degree murder. Kingston's death reminds us that there are men in this land who say they are Americans, who perhaps think that they are Americans and yet speak openly and loudly against the principles of freedom and equality, the principles of democracy. There's little difference between such men and the enemies across the seas whom we have conquered. There's little difference between such men and the criminals they so often employ. For they are criminals themselves. In the end, they will be caught. Because their crimes are crimes against the people. Against the government. Against the FBI. about next week's case in just a moment. Tonight, will you join the Equitable Society in a salute to an industry which shares the responsibility of passing on the wisdom of the world from one generation to another? An industry which makes possible the great system of free education for everyone, which is one of the foundations of our American democracy. Yes, a salute of gratitude to the book publishing industry of the United States. During the war... The publishers rose to the emergency and supplied over 90 million specially manufactured paper-bound books to the armed forces, almost 800 titles, about eight books for every serviceman or woman. Now that peace is here, we will look to the book publishers for more than 10,000 new titles each year. These will range from the scientific works, which carry forward the torch of progress, to the fiction, which relaxes you in your hours of leisure. For many years, funds of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States have been invested in the book publishing industry. In fact, Equitable Society funds have been a consistent factor in the growth and development of most of the great industries on which America depends for full employment and continued prosperity. Just as Equitable Society dollars were fighting dollars in wartime, so at all times they are security dollars for you your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The file on The Desert Dictator. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Leith Stevens. The author was Arthur Lawrence. Your narrator was Reed Hadley, who appears through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox. This is your FBI. is a Jerry Devine production. This is Dick Joy speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. Folks, the Equitable Society reminds you that tomorrow is Navy Day. We'd like to take this moment to say thanks, Navy, for a job well done. The U.S. Navy played a tremendous part in beating the Japanese. It was the tiny Pacific fleet that stopped the enemy offensive at Midway. Navy ships turned the tide of the war in the furious night battles off the Solomons. 
Halsey's powerful third fleet crushed the Jap Navy in the battles of the Philippine Sea, making it possible for American warships and planes to blast enemy cities at will. Throughout the war, the Navy has spearheaded victory. Men of the Navy deserve the gratitude of their countrymen. One of the best ways Americans can show their appreciation is by guarding the goals for which these men fought, by maintaining a strong, peacetime Navy. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for Financial Security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's file, The Desert Dictator. There is an ancient proverb which says, The sword of the wicked shall break against the wisdom of the righteous. History bears witness to the inexorable truth of that proverb. And likewise does tonight's case from the files of your FBI, in which a ruthless criminal, a killer, is defeated by it. On a desert in Arizona, two elderly men and a girl are seated before a campfire, watching the red sun poise for a moment over the peak of a distant mountain. Gradually, the red turns to pink, then to purple then indigo. Now it is night. Doc? Huh? I freshen up that fire, you could see a little better. See better? <laughs> yeah. He didn't hear a word you said, Mesa. No? Now, Larry. Uncle Harold, you know that when you're making notes, you get so engrossed, you could do it in the dark. You exaggerate my talent. Got company. Wolf. Yeah. Well, he won't bother us. I don't imagine wolves are particularly interested in archaeology. No. Doc. Yes? I'd like to ask you something. Go ahead. I like you. And I like your niece here. You're paying me good money to guide you around the desert. Well? Just what satisfaction do you get out of digging stuff out the ground that's been there for hundreds, thousands of years? <laughs> well, now, that's a fair question. Let me answer it, Uncle Harris. Sure. You see, Mesa, the past can be a guide to the present. It's important to know what made one period of civilization die in order that this one shall survive. Uh-huh. In other words, Mesa, what Larry means is if Hitler had used archaeology instead of mythology, he would have known better. <laughs> well, that makes sense, all right. Now, we came out here, Mesa, to compile data on the three ancient Indian cultures that followed each other in this country. The first period was called Basket Maker Number One. At that point, the Indians were nomads, hunters. And then Basket Maker Number Two... What's wrong? Just the horses, Larry. Uh, that wolf may be flirting around with them. i better take a look. Ah, what's the matter with you critters? What you got your noses in the wind about? Settle down now, settle down. Are they all right, Mesa? They are now, Miss Larry. Has that wolf upset them? Uh, I don't know, but something has. What do you mean? 
Well, I got a feeling that we ain't by ourselves out here. What? What's that? I think I'll just get the old carbine drop ready. Drop that gun, Lester. <laughs> you hear me? I said drop it. Now, look, I'm in the dark and you're in the light. That makes you a real easy target. I ain't dropping no gun. <laughs> I'll leave it lay there. The next one slams into you. Are you all right, Mesa? Yes, ma'am. You Wild West boys ain't the only ones that can shoot, you know. Who are you? This company. Well, you're not exactly welcome. That ain't what I'm after. His arm is bleeding, Uncle. It's been bleeding all day. Does it worry you? No. Thanks. What's the setup here? Well, speak up, one of you. Talk. I'm an archaeologist. You know what that means. I know what it means. Mummies. Well, that would be the common Egyptologist. Never mind that. But... Where do you fit in the picture, sweetheart? Me? Yeah. This old gee, your husband? He is my uncle. That you couldn't help. Who's Buffalo Bill here? Our guide. I thought maybe you dug him out of the ground. No, just a Shut minute. Shut up. Got any bandage, sweetheart? Bandage? For my arm. Go get it. When I'm fixed up, I'll tell all of you what you gotta do to be able to see the next sunrise. Okay? <laughs> A few minutes before closing time that afternoon, a lone bandit had held up the Canyon National Bank in Flagstaff, Arizona, and escaped with $20,000 after a running gun battle. The FBI office in Phoenix was notified, and shortly after sundown, Special Agent Blake drove into Flagstaff, where he conferred at once with Sheriff Hickman. Uh, two of my boys, Mr. Blake, saw the bandit when he dashed out of the bank and jumped into his car. And they opened fire on him? Well, they yelled at him to stop first, but he had his car started by then when turned off. Mm, I see. The boys fired a couple of shots, come in near the car, and took after him. How did he make his getaway, Sheriff? Well, he managed to shoot out a tire. Was he hit at all, do you know? Mm, the boys weren't sure about that. But once after they fired, they, uh, they saw his car swerve a little. Mm. Well, which way was he heading? He went east on the road leading through the painted desert. Oh. Sheriff, did you get a description of him at all? Yes, yeah, I got it written down here for you. Uh, Thanks. I've already phoned all the shirts between here and New Mexico. Oh, good. He was driving a black Buick sedan. Here's the license number. Mm -hmm. California. Oh, probably stolen. Well, we'll put out a three-state alarm right away. And after we check with California, we'll start fanning out men all over the state. All right. But if he gets off in that desert country, it's going to be hard to find. Well, he can't stay in there forever. Sheriff, hand me the phone, will you? We'll get that alarm out. Well, there you are. Yeah. Thanks, sweetheart. Yeah, it's a real good bandage. You put it on with love and care. I put it on because I had to. Stop being a female. He's evidently evolved a theory, Larry, that you're really fascinated with. Never mind the yeah. book talk, Doc. Let me give you the real feeling on me. Please do. I suppose you've all guessed by now that I didn't get shot cleaning the pistol. I, uh, borrowed the 20,000 bucks that's in this bag from a bank today. I'm gonna have to borrow your car to get it out of this country. Our car? That's right. I didn't waltz two miles across this desert to your campfire just to get a little first aid. My car burned out a bearing. I'd trade it in for yours, except that I pushed it over a cliff. <laughs> What's so funny? You're in a bad way, unless you can use a horse. What do you mean? We haven't got a car. You're lying. You've got a car on this camp somewhere. You're at liberty to look for yourself. Of course, if you care to wait until tomorrow. Larry. What did you start to say about tomorrow? I, um, was going to say the sheriff or 
Whoever's after you would probably be here by then and be very glad to give you a lift. You were talking about something else or he wouldn't have stopped you. What was it? I just told what you. What was it, sweetheart? I my arm. Come on, tell Let me. Let it be. Wait, mister. I'll tell him. Okay. There's somebody else in your party, right? There's not anybody else in our party. Okay. But somebody's going to be here with a car tomorrow. Yes. We're expecting supplies. I'm sorry, Uncle Harold. Don't be sorry, sweetheart. That helped. I was beginning to figure I was in a pretty bad spot. Well, since you think you see your way out of this now, perhaps you won't mind if we all retire. Sure, go ahead. But you'll have to hit the ground right here by the fire. Oh, yes, of course. And, Doc. Yes? In case you think you got an edge because you went to college... I just got out of San Quentin University last week. Apparently, it didn't teach you much. I taught myself, Doc. I taught myself how to stay up three days and nights without sleeping. Oh? Yeah. So go ahead with the sleeping act. But don't count on me passing out. I'll be sitting right here waiting to say good morning to all of you. And a very special good morning to whoever's coming with that car. Morning, Sheriff. Uh, good morning, Mr. Blake. Sheriff, this is Special Agent Tanner. Hello, Sheriff. How do you do, Mr. Tanner? I uh, just talked on the phone to the Los Angeles police. That black Buick sedan the bandit used was stolen there three days ago. Oh, we know who the bandit is now, Sheriff. Oh, yes? Mm -hmm. Tanner here checked your description of him with our Washington office. His name is Matt Ricker. He just got out of San Quentin last week. Well, gone back to work again already, huh? Here's his full description. Five feet ten, 165 pounds, black hair, dark skin, has a knife scar on his right cheek. You want me to put that out? We've already sent it out as a follow-up on your first alarm. Sheriff, have you had any reports from any of your men? Uh, no, sir. But by now, they're pretty well spread out over this part of the state. Oh, good. Tanner and I are just getting ready to take a run across the Painted Desert Road to Gallup. Mm -hmm. Now, if you get anything, communicate with the sheriff there. Yes. We'll be in touch with him. Then we'll double back here to Flagstaff. All right. Good. Come on, Tanner. Let's get started. <laughs> Well, how did everybody sleep? How do you think? Well, you should have knocked it off real good, knowing somebody was standing by, watching over you. That was very comforting. Thanks. Hey, Pop, pour me another cup of that... Hey, what are you doing there? Just fixing the fire. Why? You're lying. You're doing tricks with the smoke, trying to make a signal. I Get away from I there before I me. slam lead in you. And pour me a cup of that java. I ain't waiting on you. I said pour me a cup of that java. I'll get it for Pop's going to get it for me. I ain't getting you nothing. Okay, Pop, you asked no, for it. No, don't. Wait a minute. Listen. Oh. This is what I've been waiting for. All right, just stay put. If anybody lets out a crack before I get that guy under control, there'll be some blood on his sand. Well, howdy, folks. Howdy. Hello. Morning, Morning. Marshal. How's everything going? Just fine, Mr. Marshall. I got a good mess of supplies for you. Is that so? Yeah. Well, looks like you took on a new member since I was out here last, Doctor. That's right. Who is he? He just joined us last night. Well, that's funny. What's funny? You look quite a bit like a man I heard about yesterday. The man they're looking for back in Flagstaff. And if I'm not mistaken, his name is Matt Ray. Oh. Oh. Well, that's it. It didn't help you, Ricker. What do you mean? Look at the car. Huh? Your bullet pierced the gas tank. Instead of shooting your way to freedom, you've destroyed your only avenue of escape. <laughs> momentarily close the Equitable Society's presentation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on the Desert Dictator. 
We will return to this case in just a moment. Tonight, I'd like to tell you a tale of two cities and 12 letters. One city is New York, where the home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States is located. The other city we'll call Your Town, a prosperous manufacturing community somewhere in the United States. Now, on a certain day, 12 letters were exchanged between Your Town and the Equitable Society. Nine came from equitable members living in your town in closing payments on their equitable life insurance policies. On the same day, three letters from the Equitable Society, also in closing checks, arrived in your town. One check was for a very large sum of money. An investment of Equitable Society funds in your town's most important industry. A second check went to a respected doctor, who was retired under the Equitable Old Age Security Plan. The third check went to a young man in your state university, a payment on the educational insurance his father provided for him years ago. Well, that's one way that life insurance works. Money comes from your town to the Equitable Society. Money goes back to your town from the Equitable Society. Now, in place of your town... Substitute any town, city, or village in the United States in which some of the Equitable Society's three and a quarter million members live. And then multiply those 12 letters into several million a year. And it becomes very clear why we say that by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now back to the file on the Desert Dictator. The cynical irony of quicksand is that the more desperately one struggles to escape from it, the deeper one sinks into it. Matt Ricker feels the grim touch of this same irony as he watches the gasoline flow from a bullet hole in the tank of the automobile in which he had hoped to escape from the desert and the vicinity of his crime of bank robbery. All right, so I blew that chance for getting out of here. Don't waste any breath laughing at me because I'm not worried a bit. We'd hardly laugh with the body of an innocent man lying there. You've got a lot more to answer for now, mister. You don't think I'm going to sit here and wait for the law to come and get me, do you? Ricker, I wasn't very interested in you before, but now I am. What do you mean? Up to this point, you've just been a petty annoyance, which has been helpless to remove. From where I stand, you're still helpless, Doug. That remains to be seen. What do you think you're going to do? That depends entirely on what you do. No matter what I do, the odds are all in my favor as far as you're concerned. They're all in favor of the rabbit, too. But he didn't win the race. Look, Doc. I got two more days and nights before I even have to think about sleeping. Well, let's get moving. Any particular direction? I'm going to put that up to Buffalo Bill here. Put what up to me? You know this country like the Doc knows a book. Uh, what if I do? You're going to take us out of this desert to a good hideout over in the mountains somewhere. We'll figure out the rest when we get there. I ain't taking you nowhere. Yes, sir. This time is running out. I'd like for us to be there when it does. Uh, whatever you say, Doctor. We'll pack up and let's get moving. Oh, maybe this will get a word out of you, sweetheart. Well? I'll have to ride double with somebody. Guess who I've picked. Thanks. That way I won't have to look at you. Stop playing hard to get. Okay, let's get out of here. Failing to pick up any trace of Ricker on their run to Gallup across the desert, Special Agents Blake and Tanner of the FBI started back to Flagstaff. And late that afternoon, as they drove along the desert road... Blake saw something to the left of the road where ground broke sharply off into a shallow canyon. 
Uh Uh-oh. What's that? What do you see, Bob? I didn't notice that when we passed you this morning. What? Yeah. Look back there where the ground drops in. Well, looks like car tracks. Yeah. Come on, let's take a look. Mm -hmm. The car turned off the road here all right. The tire marks go right out to the edge there, too. Yeah. Hey, Bob, look down below. Mm Hmm. It's Raker's car on it. Let's get down there. Oh, wait a minute. Raker won't be in it. See? These heavy footprints in the middle of the tire tracks. Mm Mm-hmm. He must have pushed it over the side himself. Yeah. I guess it either broke down or he decided it was time to make other arrangements. Look, these footprints go across the road toward the desert. Yeah. Yeah, there they go. If I'm not mistaken, Ricker was wounded. Look. See those little dark spots here? There's some more here. Uh-huh. Hey, I just happened to think... You remember that archaeologist we met in town a couple of weeks ago? Dr. Endicott? Yeah, that's him. Uh-huh. Well, from what he told us, I believe his camp is right out in this direction. Hey, that's right. And if Ricker were here last night, he probably saw Endicott's campfire and made for it. He could have seen the fire for miles. we better get out to that camp. Where's that trail start? A few miles up the road. Come on. <laughs> Isn't that Tom Marshall's car there? Yes. Endicott seems to have broken camp. There's something wrong about this, Bob. What do you think... Hold it. It's Marshall. This must be Ricker's work. He's evidently taken Endicott's party with him. There are no supplies here. Well, then he's trying to get somewhere to hide for a while. Come on, it's getting dark fast. Look around for any sign of what direction they took. Here are some hoof prints. A lot of them. Leading north. Well, there's nothing but open country to the north. Well, maybe the trail turns later and... Hey, wait. Find something? Yeah, give me a flashlight. I hear you. Now, look at that. Looks like somebody's been drawing pictures in the sand. Well, those are Indian symbols. Well, that's your dish, Bob. What do you make of it? Well, I'd say Dr. Endicott left him. First sign is a snake. Ricker. Yeah. The stair-step pyramid represents a mountain. The sun going down behind it means west. Uh-huh. Yeah, but, but what's that twisting line across the mountain? Well, that's, um... That's the symbol for... For a trail or a road. Uh-huh. Come on, let's get Marshall's body back to the trading post and call Flagstaff. I want to get a map of this region. This is real nice. I like mountains. It smells good, don't it? With you around, Mr. Ricker, it's difficult to tell. I get it, Doc. Very funny. How about you, sweetheart? Don't that moon kind of hit you? I have to agree with my uncle. Thanks. Hey, wait a minute, Pop. I told you not to fool around with that fire. I'm just putting on some more wood. None of that signal stuff. I said I'm just putting on wood. Okay. You know something? These mountains really get me. A guy I knew in San Quentin used to make big talk about country like this. He'd talk about a row of trees like they were beautiful follies dames or something. Now I know what he means. How did he feel about killing people? What do you mean? How did he feel about shooting someone in cold blood as you did today? That's why he was in San Quentin. Let's turn in, Larry. Hold it. You guys can turn in. She's going to stay up. What? I want someone to help me look at that moon. Come on, sweetheart. Let's take a little walk. With you? Yeah. (laughs) You're going to be sorry you've done that. All of you are going to be sorry. I'm just about fed up with all this fooling around. The car. Car? A yeah. car way up here. 
I forgot to tell you, there's a road runs 50 feet west of here. Put out that fire. You're a little too late, Mr. Ricker. Oh, no, I ain't. Give me that gun. You... Let go of me. All right, Ricker. Drop that gun. Drop it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Blake. I gather you found the symbol. Yes, Dr. Endicott. There's one you neglected to draw, sir. The electric chair. Matt Ricker was tried and convicted on the charge of first-degree murder. He was put to death in the state penitentiary. The career of crime is a losing game. And neither the criminal's wit nor his cunning nor his guns can overcome it. For they are no match for the thing which inevitably defeats him. The collective skill and intelligence of those who enforce the law. He is but one. They are many. He is fallible. They are sure-footed. He is wrong. They are right. And as the ancient proverb says, the sword of the wicked shall break against the wisdom of the righteous. You'll hear about next week's case in just a minute. This week, at the Equitable Society, Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Society, showed me a letter he'd received from an American mother who was mighty proud of her son. He's just been released from the Army Air Corps, holds two decorations, and is a veteran of 47 bombing missions. In her letter to President Parkinson, this mother said... I think the members of the Equitable Society can be proud of my son, too. Because the Equitable Society helped his father and me plan his education. The Equitable Society helped me keep my home after his father died. And bring my son up as his father wanted me to. Well, you can imagine how happy that letter made us all. For no matter how often it happens... We're always glad to see what a warm, friendly feeling equitable members have for their society. Also, that letter reminded us that years ago, when that mother's son was still a baby, the Equitable Society's management was just as alert to the needs of the future as the Equitable Management is today. It made us happy to know that as we work hard today to keep the Equitable Society progressive and forward-looking... We're following a great tradition. Yes, this week and every week for over 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the bogus bankruptcy. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner... The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States 
and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. This is the American Broadcasting Company.